see, the thing is, I've never understood slut shaming. Like, I, I still, to this day, I just like, why would you look at a person who's decided, you know, because, you know, you, you're on your own body. What you do with it is up to you. You know, I've never understood why people go out of their way to say, oh, you know, it's really bad that you like sex. No, it's not. It's really bad you like Nazis or something. Not if you like sex. Hello, I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. This week, we are welcoming back an old guest. And that's old, as in he's been on the show before, not that he is old. My guest is none other than Craig Law. He is a DJ and also hosts the In The Mix show on Gadio, the world's biggest LGBT radio station. The last time that he was here, he told me all about his early days of gay clubbing in his hometown of Swansea, Wales. This time around, we are visiting Manchester's Gay Village and the Lost Club, Kiki. Now, if you've ever listened to this show before, you know what to expect. You know that we do tend to sometimes, maybe, occasionally, perhaps, veer off topic. And this week, I fear we may have outdone ourselves. So... As well as me learning about Craig's days drowning in paperwork as a defense paralegal and how DJing and the queer scene saved him from that life, we also discuss, in no particular order, the logistics of hooking up with strangers when you're staying in a hotel with key cards and heavy security, getting your friends to set you up with their friends and all the troubles that that can cause, bottom shaming, uh, the concept of camp and how to apply it, and I even have time to pitch my new business idea for coaching pea-shy men. Shall we, shall we just get on with the show then? I've always had a really low opinion of myself. You know, I'm, I'm quite self-deprecating. I've been trying to stop that because my friends have told me to stop doing it. Um, Wait, is it self-deprecating or self-pitying? You know, you'd have to ask them, but I probably think they'd say more self-pity, but it comes out as deprecating. Okay. So, so I, I used to make little comments, you know, about how short I am or, you know, how I'm ginger and, and, and all these things. How short are you? Very short. I'm like, I'm like really short. <gasps> Like, like super short. four foot two. Okay, I'm not that short. Okay, I didn't say I was in like a little person town. No, I'm like five foot five. Okay, so but if you were next to Kylie, you'd look big. If I was next to Kylie, I'd be weeping. I don't know why I said that. I'd be weeping <laughs> if I was next to Kylie. I'd be. I'd why? Because be like, of her perfume. No, well, uh, oh, you're shading <laughs> Kylie. I'm going to leave. You can't shade Kylie. No. I'm not shading Kylie. I'm <gasps> just asking why you'd be crying. Because I'd be in the presence of Kylie Minogue. It's like I'd 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 be like bowing to her, curtsying. You'd be like you, you'd be like in front of pop royalty. I I, that, that, I don't think I think that's like one celeb. I how do interview. you think? How do you think she would respond to that? Getting a restraining order, probably. If I was her, <laughs> that's what I would do. Yeah, she'd probably block me on all social media and everything. But, but uh, oh, so you're five foot five? I'm five foot five. And, I don't know and, if I've imagined how tall you are. And, and to be honest, I've always kind of buried that stat and now i'm kind of like being very much owning it it's kind of like okay i don't care well how do you bury I, how do you bury it do you mean like online yeah so you, you know like I, it's not something you could really hide very easily <laughs> yeah so i used to bury it with self-deprecation you know i, I what was what did i used to say on grind up my, my friend hated it something about being a short ginger midget midget you know, something like that. And, and my friend, I remember my friend saw it on Grindr and he was like, no, 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 no. That's like the least sexy thing ever. And um, I have a really important question for you right now. Go on. What do you think of the term pocket gay? I love it. Really? <laughs> I love it. I, lo I love it. Do you not find it a bit 
And Celtic? No, not really. D- no, no, you're probably asking the wrong person because it is a, okay. there's a lot of things I don't find offensive or insulting. It, you know, my tolerance for it is so, so low. <laughs> so it's it's like, yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But I don't find it insulting. I just, I, I'd find it kind of cute, actually. Max used to call me his short. His short? <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was from a TV show we, we, we watched. I, I can't remember the show, but it was a show and, and there was like a, a couple in there and, and one was tall and one was short and they used to refer to each other as the tall and the short. You know, you're my tall, you're my short. And it was really cute. I mean, goofy as hell now I'm saying it out loud, but... Um, but do you have people assuming that you're a bottom because of your height? Oh my god, all the time. Yeah. All the time. But not just that. It's just about apparently, right? And, and this, okay, are you ready for this? This is this is uh-huh. you you've you've pushed one of my buttons now. Okay, so I hope you're ready for this. This is all on you. Okay, this is all on you. Okay, okay. sock it to me. Yeah, I'm gonna sock it to you, baby. Yeah. Um <laughs> people always assume, right? And, and this drives me nuts. Really drives me nuts. People always assume that I'm quite camp and effeminate. Now, I don't have a problem with that at all. But I'm not. It's just that I I can be quite um, outgoing in the way I speak. And, you know, I always say I have Italian hands. I'm always moving my hands. Like, even now, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving my hands. And I don't know why. No one's watching. Is that a xenophobic thing to say? It probably is. It probably is. But, <laughs> but it's just all those things where I'm being tarred with a brush that that I, I don't deserve. You know, and, and, and again, no problem with it. But people have kind of preconceptions then when they hear, oh, you know, Greg's quite camp. You know, it, it gives other people a preconception about me that... Okay, we're talking about two different things here. So let, but let's just talk about this camp thing first. Okay. So they're making assumptions that you're camp because you are camp? <laughs> well, because, no, because they associate with my ability to speak quite well. I, well, I hope I can speak quite well. I think you can. Thank yes. you. Uh, but they, they're assuming that and the fact that I use my hands is, is quite a a camp thing, you know, and, I, and I've got effeminate friends and everything and I love them. Um, but I, I Some don't... of my best friends are effeminate. Yeah, oh my God, yes. <laughs> yeah, some, some of my best friends and are so you're saying, And so you're saying that that is an indicator of your sexual preference if you're deemed to be camp. But not just sexual preference, just in terms of a person's predisposition of your personality. Like, I, I remember a person coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, you must really, really like Kylie. And yes, I do, but it's nothing to do with the fact <laughs> that you think I'm camp or you think I'm, you know, I'm gay. It's just that Kylie makes awesome music that can be appreciated by any person, irrespective of their mannerisms or sexuality or whatever. She comes up a lot on this show. What about Cher, though? What's the litmus test there? Love her. I mean... Okay, well, I mean, these people might all have a point. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I also like Coldplay. Oh, okay, that's not helping your case. Okay, how is Coldplay camp? <laughs> I, I'm gonna okay. I, actually, hang on, let me dial that back because <clears throat> how is Coldplay camp? Uh, <laughs> no, okay, but the bigger thing here is you don't like being called camp. I have no problem being called camp, but I hate being prejudged. I hate it. I hate I, that, I, that, that 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 someone so help has. Help me understand then. So what does okay. that like? What does that mean to you? If someone prejudges you as being camp, why is that a problem? I think it's just because that in in our community, I think it's always been that that camp people have always been viewed with quite a bit of disdain, in my uh-huh. experience. And I don't. And uh-huh. I, again, that's another thing I don't like because you know that's a, you know our community can be quite judgmental at times, and and that's not something I really like. Again, it's, it goes into that top and bottom shaming thing, you know, where one role is see, is deemed to be more subversive than the other, and I think mm-hmm. that's that, you know, when you and and Which people is think total of bullshit, yeah, yeah, it, it is, it's total bullshit, and it's just yeah. So I mean, it's not just about me calling camp. I hate it when people, you know, think that I'm posh. I've had that before, just because I I wear glasses, and I, and, and one time I went out to a gay bar wearing a jumper over shirt. I think I came from work. <sighs> You know, I was doing an office job and someone went, oh, you know, you're oh, really posh. I mean, and I was like, how the posh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is Wales to be fair. It probably is posh in Wales. But, you know, but again, it's just, a, I just hate being prejudged, whether people think I'm camp or posh or whatever. I just hate it. I'd rather people just get to know me on face value and the fact that, yes, I am gay. I love Kylie, but I also love football. And, you know, and again, I know plenty of, of gays like that, you know, that are just like, don't just say, oh, you know, you're the camp one or the, or like I used to get when I used to work in offices, people used to make me the gay one and it drove me nuts. It drove me absolutely nuts. I was like, of all the things you could assign to my personality, you choose the least interesting thing. I know. Like, why wouldn't they call you the short ginger one? Exactly. 
You know, why not? <laughs> It's just, I just, yeah, I just, I just hate all of it. I just hate being prejudged. It's not just about, you know, I have no problem being called camp because I, I think we all have a little bit of camp in us. I think it's just, so I, I struggled with that word yeah. myself for years. And I think it's just because for me, camp is just such a like a, a nothing concept. It's so like, it's so broad yeah. and also so narrow and I can't get my head around what is camp and what isn't camp. Like, I mean, I, apart from the obvious, but you know, when people use camp as a descriptor, I'm just like, oh, how did they come up with that? <laughs> See, I'm not good at what? that. I'm with you there. I don't, I don't know when something, you know, when there's, I mean, there's something that looks camp, you know, like like someone will bring out a purse and I go, oh, that's camp. And I'm like, well, I, I don't understand. Yeah, because it's kind of like a kitschiness, right? Yeah. I think. But they're not interchangeable. They're, they're slightly different somehow, but I don't really get it, to be totally honest. But yeah, there was a period of time when I was a teenager, I remember when people were calling everything camp and it was just like, I yeah. don't care, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I can't join in because I don't know like how you're classifying these things. Um, but yeah, I, I, going back to this thing about... Uh, your height and people <laughs> assuming that you're a bottom because of your height. Like it's really just to me an indication of how heteronormative queer culture can be. Mm. And even though we rally against it, heteronormativity, like it's kind of inescapable, right? Ish. I mean, again, and that goes back to me, what, you know, loving the fact that the world is more free. You know, there's just so much to our community than just being tops and bottoms. I mean, uh, you know, it, there's, there's so much more to it now. Like what? Well, there's first tops, first bottoms, there's sides. I mean, I learned about sides a few years ago and that opened my eyes. And I think that's the thing. I, I think we're going down that path and thank God we are. I think we're going down the path where we now stand to realise where people people are different. I mean, that's so cliche. It's so corny, but it's true. And I think we've gone away from all these labels now where you're either this or that. You know, when there's know. so much grey area. Actually, no, not grey area, rainbow have. area. There's so much rainbow area. <laughs> you know, there's so much more to it. And I, I As long as there's no glitter. Yeah, gl- glitter's a bitch. Yeah, it's horrible. Especially um, in your beard. I've, I just, I've, I'm, I'm still oh. picking glitter oh, out of my yeah. beard. That is an occupational hazard for you, isn't it? A little bit. But mm. um, yeah, going back to it, I think it's great. I think it's great that we now stand to embrace everyone's... Um, differences and recognizing the differences and kind of just saying fuck yeah everyone's different let's just go go along with it i don't know like if we go back to the top of our conversation where we were talking about how sex is far more transactional Mm. now you kind of need to boil yourself down to one thing in order to make yourself appealing on grinder or on scruff or whatever you need to have this unique selling point you can't be like i'm a complex being but Otherwise, I've seen that on Grindr. Like, oh, I've seen that. Yeah, and what have you done? You've blocked those people, right? No. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I, just, I mean, there's a difference between someone who sounds like an absolute nutcase. I mean, you see those on Grindr. You know, the people who are like, you know, no fats, no femmes, no whatever. Mm. You know, those kind of really gone in the head people, you know. And there's a difference between that and a person who's kind of embracing their their differences and, and you know and those people on grind that i kind of like because you know sometimes like when you go to london you, you load up the grinder grid and it's all faceless profiles or really muscly guys with very specific requirements and um yeah i, I kind of like seeing that but I, I know what you mean i think i think in order to be successful on a dating app you do have to boil yourself down to some you know common denominator to, to appeal to the kind of person you want to have yourself. sex with yeah so we're talking about manchester we're talking about Kiki in Manchester. Kiki, yes. So I, I want to play a game with you. Okay. I'm going to start a sentence and you're going to finish it for me, okay? Okay. The one word that I would use to describe Kiki is... Lively. Mm. My favourite thing about Kiki was... The people. And if it wasn't for Kiki... Yeah. Yeah, that's it. If it wasn't for Kiki. Well, I can't say one word after that. It'd be a terrible sentence. No, it doesn't have to be one word. Oh, okay. I thought it was a one word thing. Sentence. God, you were not listening to my instructions. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what was what was the thing again? What was the prompt? <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for Kiki. I'd probably be dying of boredom working as a, a, a law person somewhere and just, just, yeah, hating everything. A law person. Yeah. It's very non-specific. 
Well, yeah, because I was a, I was a paralegal and, you know, I, I might have gone on the train to become a solicitor or something, but it wouldn't be what I'm doing now. And I, and I, and I hated every second of it. So shall we go back in time to those days then? To those days, yeah. As a paralegal. Okay. So tell me about it. Where were you? Where were you working? What were you doing? Oh, you don't um, the name. I, 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 I won't name and shame them, but I was working uh, for a public sector legal organization as a as a defense paralegal. So, you know, sometimes, you know, when the company's employees do something wrong, I have to defend them. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I thought I always wanted to be kind of like a lawyer or barrister. You know, I thought that was what I was supposed to do. You know, so, I, you know, I went to uni, did law school, you know, did all of that. And then when I finally got to actually do it, I realized I hated it. Oh, that sucks. It was just so boring and just so needlessly intense and, and just, you know, you'd look around the room and, 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 and everyone there hated what they were doing, you know. And I, and my mum, God bless her soul, she always used to say, you know, if you get up and you hate what you're doing, then, you know, you're, you're not living. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that, that was kind of my path. I mean, I was, I mean, we talked in the last episode about um, Shampers, you know, in Swansea mm-hmm. and, you know, I was DJing part time there whilst I was working in law. And yeah, and it just so ah. happened that that was what I was doing. I was DJing at the weekends part time and my future was being a paralegal and, you know, and I, I hated it. I hate, you know, I, I look back now and I realize that it, I, it just wasn't a very healthy thing for me. So what was the catalyst then? What was the thing that got you out? So it, it basically it's a two pronged thing. So the first thing was I got off the chance to join Gadio. And uh-huh. it's kind of, you know, I, I did a few cover shows for Gadio and I, I did, you know, I did, I did some mixes and I got to know the Gadio team. And, and one of them was my good friend and now my boss, Chris Herbert. And he was working at Gadio and we got to know each other really well. And, you know, we got on really well. And he had just started in a new bar in Manchester called Kiki. So they were looking for DJs for Manchester Pride one year. You know, because dude in Pride, the bars are open pretty much from the morning until you know, the next morning. Uh-huh. Um, so they need like all the DJs. So he was like, oh, you know, why don't you come up and, and do a set of Kiki? You know, and, and to be honest, I didn't think anything of it, really. I just thought, you know, I'm going to be up there anyway for Manchester Pride, like I did most years. So I thought I'll go and play this set. So I played downstairs in Kiki, um, what used to be called Void. You know, is 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 the late, late club. It'd be open until 10 in the morning. But I played there, did in Pride, and there was like no one there. I, I mean, I swear to God, I was DJing to no one but the bar staff in this in this Aww. basement room. I, I've just said, oh, but how does that feel for you? Like, is that actually kind of like fun? Because you get to just do what the fuck you want? It, it, to be honest, it used to really kind of piss me off. Well, not piss me off. It just, I always thought it would be my fault. Yeah, yeah. You know, even though there's nothing you could have done because it's the time. You know, I look back and I think, of course, no one's there. It was a sunny day and everyone's outside. Of course, someone's not going to be in a basement club at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> um, mm. So again, that's all that's all down to me, again, kind of recalibrating, you know, the way I think about things. So yeah, I, I, I DJ to no one. And, and unbeknownst to me, it was a trial shift. Chris didn't tell me this, but it was a trial oh. shift. Um, so he was in the corner spying on you. But no, he was, I think he was on the main stage, actually. But, he didn't <laughs> tell, but, no, but the, what I didn't realise was the manager of the venue was listening. And I had no idea. So I just did my thing and just tried to enjoy it as much as you can, you know, when you're playing to a room of nobody. And, mm-hmm. you know, I and just, and just did my thing, collected my money and, and went away. And then literally the week after they get in touch and they say, you know, we really like your set. And I remember the time going, you're taking the piss now. You know, you're taking the piss. There was no one there to DJ to. And, <laughs> and they're like, no, we like, we like what you did. And, and I ended up doing a few Friday nights. A kiki. And, you know, it's a big deal, you know, for me, you know, coming from, from, you know, a little town in South Wales to play on Canal Street, you know, which is, mm. I, I can't think of any areas in the world better than Canal Street to be a gay. I just can't, or, you know, a lesbian or LGBT, you know, it's just, it's just the most amazing place. Even now I've been DJing there eight years now and I still love it every time I play in Canal Street. So to be given the chance to play there and I thought, you know, I'll do a couple of cover shifts and it'd be great. It's a four hour commute, but it's, it's worth it. <sighs> so, for those of us who haven't been to Canal, I don't know why I said it like that because I have been to Canal Street, yeah. but for, for those of us, oh, anyway, let's just go with that. So for those of us that have never been to Canal Street, what is it that's so magical about it? I think it's it's a mix of the history and just the fact that there's this one, well, I say one street, but of course there's the whole Manchester gay village, um, that there's this one area where you can just be unashamedly you. Because even today, I think there's places that people who are LGBT can go into and, and, and not quite feel like being themselves. 
you know, feel like they can be themselves without being targeted or or, mm-hmm. or judged, you know. And I, and the thing about Canal Street is, uh, from the first second I ever went there, just as a, a customer, to when I was there last week playing a gig in you know the big gay super club, it, it is the, the sense of magic that you can be whatever the hell you want to be, and it's completely fine. Just don't mm-hmm. be an asshole. That's like the rule. <laughs> and how does that feel? It feels amazing. It, it it really does. You know, when you think about all the venues that have come before it, all the people that have come before it, you know, all the history of, of Canal Street. And when you're DJing and you're looking out and you see all these really young LGBT people who are starting their their journey that, that that most of us did, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, they stand their own thing. And it just it just makes me so happy that there's an area where uh, you know, people can go and be themselves and have a great time, be safe and just express themselves without fear of repercussions. Mm. You sound like you 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 feel as though you're an elder in the community. I kind of, I do feel like that now. Yeah, I do. I kind of feel like that now, I think, because uh, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been around a while now by Canal Street terms. But um, So then to how often do you use the term when I was your age? Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really awkward because I, I I swear I think I used it with my niece at the weekend. So, I, <laughs> but I, I always hear myself saying something like that. I mean, I I, I remember um, I was telling a story on Gadio and someone he texts in going, "Why is it every time you're on air you always make it sound like old people should just you know it's such a bad thing to get old?" <gasps> Do you? Yeah, and you know I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't realize that I was so negative about growing old you know in in the lgbt sphere and is that you talking about your own age and making a joke of yeah, it yeah yeah it's just me on. just yeah okay. I, I would never insult someone else's age so you know, it wasn't I'd... you going like, yeah oh God, so I, I was old, saying about i think i was i think i was making some <laughs> stupid thing about someone calling me daddy on grinder just something really you know just mm-hmm. pointlessly stupid and then it made me realize then that you know we, we're saying these things and we don't realize how they're being interpreted or how they're making people feel. And, you know, I remember mm. reading it. And I mean, my first instinct was to go, oh, you know, piss off. But then, you know, I, I listened back to what I said and I thought, and I thought, you know what, you, you've actually got a point. It goes back to that whole, my friends telling me not to be self-deprecating thing. You know, what the hell is wrong with being, you know, gay and getting older? There's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. Just embrace it. And I certainly should be negative about it on a on an LGBT radio station. You know, it, it made yeah. me just kind of, it made me think about the things I say and the way I say it. It's um, it's really interesting. And it's hard to, to disentangle from the wider society because I know lots of people who are like, well, I really wish I could go back to school, but there's no point because I'm 35. Mm. And it's like, um, <laughs> you know, like if you're lucky, then you're going to live to like 80 90 like you, I think you've got time to do this if like if, if you want to do it but people are just so like no I've had my chance that's it so uh, sorry that's a bit of a meandering statement but <laughs> it's very prevalent in the gay community and and it's just really fucking annoying yeah it is I think my thing came from living in an era when I was going out clubbing where where old people were were kind of described to me as being quite mm. seedy and quite um, and now you're the CDO. Exactly. <laughs> um, but no, obviously you get to know them and you realize it's not like that at all. Yeah. I, I just think it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of environment that I was kind of brought up into. And, and thank the Lord that, you know, the, the, the gays of today or that the LGBT people of today are uh, coming up in a much more enlightened environment. Thank God. Well, I don't know if they are. I, I think just... they are. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just a, an, an optimist. Um, I don't know. I just think people never stop being pricks. I mean, that's true. I mean, that, that's true with everyone I've ever dated. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, we could talk about this all night. I think that I mean, it's a running joke that apparently I love twinks. You know, there's like there's, there's like there's like a huge running joke that um, that I like twinks. And, 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 you know, looking at my exes, they probably got a point. You know, I probably did. Probably, I probably do have a very specific type. I don't subconsciously go out there and think, oh, you know. That's the only person I'd ever date. Maybe I was like that five years ago, but I think today I'm far more... Um... Desperate. Yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, I'm far more desperate. <laughs> Thank you. Please date me. Please date me. If you don't want to date me, just have sleep with if me. You, if you're interested in Craig, then call this <laughs> number now. I'm not paying um, you commission. Why not? You're not my pimp. Well, no, I'm just the matchmaker. <laughs> and I think that that's a very... I think that's a service that should be paid for. 
No, absolutely not. So, okay, so if someone <laughs> listens to this episode and then gets in touch with you and then you fall in love and get married, you're not going to be like... I'll do you another podcast, okay? Yeah, that's that's what you get. £20. <laughs> I, we'll, we'll jump on a podcast and we'll do a thing about how we fell in love, all thanks to you. Oh, well, now I'm just not going to bother. Oh, great. Now just it sounds like me on Grindr. not setting you up with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> See, here's the thing. Actually, you can you can help me with this. Should I be offended that none of my friends, none of my close friends, have set me up with their gay friends? But so, the, so okay. Let's so a few more details are, are, that I will need before I can make a statement on this. Have you asked them to do that for you? Yes, yes. And what was their response? Well, they just kind of um and ah, and they go, you know, well, you know, I I don't know if you two are compatible. Well, hi, give me a go. Um. I think I'm with your friends on this one. Oh. Not like I obviously I don't know them. How do I disconnect? But if you said it to, if you said it to me like just set me up with someone. Okay. I I would do it, but only if it was someone who I thought yes, that's going to work. Because if I did it and you both hated each other, then who are you going to blame? Um probably the other guy? No, me. I'm the one. <laughs> no, blame. no. No. No, it's You're just like Oh, he has terrible taste in friends. No, it's just, it's just, I see all these people who are like, oh, we met through friends. And it, it occurred to me a while back and I was like, hang on. Get better friends, Craig. Yeah, you know what I need to. They'll probably listen to this. So yeah, you're all fired. <laughs> Bring me the gays. Bring me your finest homosexuals, please. Uh, but do you not think if you, oh, it's just, no, it creates weirdness if you no. date friends, friends. Like, it's just getting to that point now where, you know, I'm getting, well, I say broody, but apparently that means you want a kid. Um, and I'm definitely not broody for the kids, you know, no uh-huh. way, no ma'am. No. But you're ready to make a nest. Y- yeah, just no no kids. Um, yeah, I just, I just kind of am. I don't know if it's because I've been watching way too many rom-coms or something, but I don't know. I just kind of, you know, I've kind of gone past that. Like even last weekend when I was in Manchester, usually I'd be trolling Grindr and trying to get people to come to the hotel, you know, standard. Mm. Um, well, see, this is, but, so do, do, do you have to like go down and let them in? It depends on the hotel. This and weird, you, yeah, see, it's annoying see, this is where I have hotel. a billion dollar idea. Oh, a billion pound uh-huh. idea, sorry. Okay. So what if, right, there was like a trip advisor, but it's exclusively for gays, right? Or you know, LGBT people. And it literally rates how good the hotel is for hookups. You know, do do they need a key there to is, come up to the there room? Is. Is there, there is. Is there? Yes. No way. I think, I think it's called Come Down Hotels or something. Okay, I'm Googling this. I'm worried about Googling this, but I don't care. Hang on, I'm Googling this. Come damp hotels. What did yeah. it? Oh my God, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's already been, it's already been created. <laughs> You've stolen your idea. Okay, the headline's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for a hotel to wait on all fours with a door unlocked? Trying to find a holder seat? <laughs> I love it. Oh, oh, you've got to give your email. Maybe I should put my boss's email in there. <laughs> He'd love that. But maybe you can, um, maybe you can be like a, an investor, get in on, on the ground floor. It needs, it definitely needs a better website, but oh, I, I can't believe, hang on, who's it? Who won't, created by Global Go- Glory Hull. Excellent. Okay, of course. <laughs> Excellent. No, but it's an amazing idea. It is an amazing idea. How, so how does the business model work? Because if it was TripAdvisor, they'd be getting a commission for every sale. But I don't think very many hotels are going to want to be listed. <laughs> I don't know. Here. Affiliate ads or something like <laughs> that. I haven't thought about the business side of things, you know. Okay, all right. Sorry, sorry. But that's the just, concept's yeah. so good. So yeah, so there's definitely hotels in certain places where I mean, there's an there's a notorious one in Manchester that's basically a sex hotel. It, it, there's no other way of putting it, and it's a horrible hotel. It's it's ah, oh, so grim. But lots of people stay there, and lots of things go on there. Oh, so interesting. I wonder if that's like in their business model. Like it has to be like their comm strategy or something like i don't know but they, I think, yeah they have to know right they have to know when they see all these shifty looking men coming through reception yeah so it's just yeah. it's just one of those things but you know it's a great business model and you know but th- th- there's definitely hotels in every city that that you'd stay at that are better for hookups than say your travel lodges which have like bouncers on the door and everything and that's just like okay no you can't have anyone back there. Yeah, yeah, you just can't be bothered. It's homophobic. <laughs> I mean, how, you can't expect me to just sleep in my hotel if I'm paying this much for it. You better believe I, I want to get some sex. How dare you not let me have 15 strangers over? Exactly. How am I supposed to get this flotilla of power bottoms through the door <laughs> when there's a bouncer, you know? 
<laughs> it's just oh. yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. But um, oh. I can't remember what we were talking about. <laughs> we were talking about oh, you're getting broody, but not broody. You're just wanting to settle down. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and that's probably an age thing. I guess. I guess I'm just getting kind of relationship broody. And um, but so when was the last like proper relationship, or you know, like uh, semi-serious relationship? Oh God, um, it's about two years ago, actually. Two, yeah, two and a bit years ago. So maybe it's just that, like, you're over the novelty of being single, and you're like, oh yeah, I could do with something different. Maybe I just, I, I guess it just comes down to. I mean, one of the things I really hate about D, you know, when you when you're a touring DJ, you know, when like a lot of DJs only DJ in the local city, I I, I tend to go everywhere, you know, I'm a mm-hmm. bit of a DJ slut. Yeah, I just it gets really lonely, and I, I you know I, I know I don't want violins to start playing or anything, but it, it it does actually get really really lonely, and you know, and it happened to me at the weekend, you know, I was stuck in Manchester because of the the damn storm, and I had to stay oh. another night at the hotel, and you know what, I didn't talk to a single person for about 10 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gets lonely, you know, and, and it made me think about the times where I drag my boyfriend with me, you know, on the road and how good it was coming back from a gig. And, you know, when you, and sometimes, you know, you feel like you've done shit and you come back and he's in your bed and you just have a really nice coach and it's like, oh, okay. So, oh. yeah, I, th- I think I think that's why I'm particularly broody now. So first of all, we just need to explain that cooch is... <laughs> oh, did I? I don't think I said that right, did I? Go on, say it again, say it again. Co- Oh, I, I can't. Oh, now I'm Go on, self-conscious. Cooch. cooch. No, no. Oh. Okay, cooch. It's cooch's vagina, isn't it? Yes, but that's why it's like because it's just like a hug. It's so warm and yeah. But a cooch doesn't involve vaginas. Surrounds you. <laughs> there's no vaginas. Well, I, I I don't know what kind of cooching you guys do, but there's no vaginas in my cooching. Any, anyway, so it's a Welsh <laughs> word for hug, cuddle. Yes, but is there any more nuance to it? No, it's just that Welsh people are the best huggers in the world. If hugging was an Olympic sport, Wales would be top of it every time. And so let's just say it one more time. Cooch. Cooch. No. Cooch. 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 So it's uh, 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 like, cooch. Like, like butch. Like butch, cooch. but cooch. There we are. That's, that's okay. a good way. Like butch, but cooch. All right, cool. Cool. I'm down. So good. what do you want to do? You just want to come home and have a cuddle? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, uh, cuddling's the best. Hmm. I mean, that is the thing I miss the most in in all relationships is is just the you know the the cuddling and and just just having someone else around you know and just yeah that's that's something oh. I really do miss. See, I I get that companionship thing, but like the cuddling, I oh, I just I'm not. What are you not a cuddler? <laughs> I just like it's fine, and then it's not fine. What okay? At what point does it become not fine? Like about thirty seconds in. <laughs> oh, okay. They're doing it wrong. They do. You got to find the nook. You have to find the nook. Okay. Are you the big spoon or the little spoon? You, I prefer big spooning. Okay, so they've got to find your nook. <sighs> I just don't know. Are we? Um, what? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I just think it's not for me. I mean, I'm 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 disappointed in you, and I think you should be sent to a war crimes tribunal. But um... hang on, hang on, <laughs> you're not into slut shaming, but you're into yeah. shaming. No, I just cut shame you. Not into cuddling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine, fine. Okay, great. so if you're not well, cutting a guy, I, what are you doing? If I disappear, so, so, it's so, because of crime. So when you're in bed with a guy and you're not having sex or any kind of sexual thing, what do you do with the guy? I'm on the other side of the bed. Oh no! You can send me a postcard. Yeah. Oh, the poor guy. No, not no. Oh, God. Are you one of those guys that like after 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 he's finished is like, OK, get away from me. Go away. Yes. Ah, OK. OK. Yeah. But not like in a horrible way. Just in a like, <laughs> don't, don't touch me. <laughs> don't touch me. <laughs> You're so charming. <laughs> no, but it's like, you know, I like, no, I... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm a, do you want to end the conversation? <laughs> I do. I just, I just, I, I feel so, I feel so violated. The only exception to that rule, I think, for me, is that I can't, uh-huh. like, you know how some couples like they'll cuddle like all night when they're sleeping. Oh, it's disgusting. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. No, have an opinion, why don't you? Um, <laughs> no, but I can't do that because, especially with my ex, he was basically a, a human radiator um so you know after the cuddling i'm like okay get off the other side of the bed you're way too hot and it's just yeah but uh, so we have okay. the coach and then and then we so then how long would the coach last 
Oh, if it was me, it'd be hours. Really? It'd be hours if it was me. Oh, God, I, it's the, like me, me and one of my other exes, we used to have this thing where we would wake up and we'd listen to Radio 2, like we'd be in a hotel sometimes, so we'd listen to Radio 2, and they'd have Popmaster on with Ken Bruce, and we'd play Popmaster while I was cuddling, and it was like the best, the best thing ever. I guess you had to be there. Yeah, well, no, Popmaster rocks anyway, but, you know, just <laughs> throwing coaching, and it's like amazing. <laughs> And so how long would that last? Oh, it'd be hours, I think, until checkout, pretty much. Oh, jeez. So it was great. It was, yeah, it was great. I, I, again, it might just be a Welsh thing, you know, like I don't think you'd meet very many Welsh people who don't love a good kutch. I mean, is it a Welsh thing? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't think I've met a Welsh person that doesn't love a kutch, but I, again, I'm, you know, I, I'm surprised you don't. So, you know, what do I know? What do I know? Hmm. Anyway, Manchester. <laughs> yeah, it's Kiki. And, and Kiki. Let, let's spend some time there. So, okay. no, no, let's go one step back, paralegal. Do yeah. you remember the decision to be like, I'm not doing this anymore? Yeah, I actually do because it was it was pretty horrific. So um, I had I had a paycheck. I had just done a full weekend of DJing and then I looked at my pay slip and I realized that I only got paid like a little bit more for doing a month's worth of work for the same that I was doing for a weekend. Ah, but then I remember telling myself, you know, oh, this is, you know, you could, if you want to be a solicitor or you want to be, a, you know, a big in the legal sector, these are the, you know, you got to pay your dues and, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And then I remember opening, I mean, I'm not kidding. There was literally piles of case files on your desk. I mean, I, I mean, it happens in movies, but it's true. You go into most law offices and people's desks are piles of case files. So I mm -hmm. pick up my next one and <laughs> I did a lot of medical work, like medical defense work. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not kidding. It was so grim. It was a photo of a woman's cesarean section gone wrong. And oh. that's when I realized I wasn't being paid enough to do this crap. And there's more to life. And I just went home and I was just like, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I just, I just cannot do this. I hated the office. I hated the people. I hated the work. I hated everything from the moment I woke up until the time I got home. You know, I hated it all. And I just mm -hmm. realized I couldn't do that for the next 40 years. And and to be fair, it wasn't me who made the decision. It was my mother, actually, who, who who made the decision for me because she could see that I was just so unhappy, you know. Oh, wow. She, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm quite an upbeat person. Yeah, yeah. My mother's never really saw me as someone who's, like, quite depressing or anything like that. You know, I've never been like that. But I think that was one time in my life where I just hated getting up in the morning. And so, so what did your mum do? Well, she was just like, you know, like, no job is worth this. Nothing is worth this at all. You know, she's like, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? And I was like, no, actually, I don't. I don't, I don't think I can do it for the rest of my life. And she went, well, why don't you do something you want to do? What do you want to do? And I said, well, if I could, I'd make money from being a DJ. And she went, well, why, why don't you give that a go? Wow. And uh, and that's where it all started. And so did you quit dramatically or? I wish I did. Aww. I mean, I wish I, I could have said I went out in like a blaze of thing, but I just I remember giving my, at that time, I think I only had to give two weeks notice and I did like four days. And, and that's when I was like, I, I would literally jump off a bridge if I have to come in. So I just fall in sick oh, really? because I just, I couldn't do it. I just, I, I could, I mean, and it's the only time I think in my life where I physically could not bring myself to do, to do something like that that's because so I just, I just couldn't do it. I hated it. Do you ever think about where you would be now if you had stayed at it all the time all the time I, I, you know because you know like like everyone has those moments where you're lying in bed it's two in the morning you can't get asleep and then your, your brain decides to say hey let's play that game of you know what what if uh -huh. um so yeah all the time and i'm scared like i i, I don't know what would i i what, what kind of person i would have become if my mum hadn't stepped in and because i always thought you know that that's the thing i had to do you know Mm -hmm. that you know you had to get this job and it didn't matter if you loved it or hated it you know you just had to pay the bills and mm -hmm. it, it was soul destroying and i think my mum could see that that it was it was literally eking out my soul that all the joy that i used to have you know and all the things that i used to love about life are just gone just mm -hmm. doing this thing that i just I, and i thought i was supposed to do and my mum saw that and you know, and God bless. I, I, I genuinely think my mum saved my life. So when you're having these conversations with yourself in the middle of the night, what do you imagine? I imagine just being deeply unhappy. Oh, okay. You know, bitter. So you're never like, oh, 
I wish I had. No, never. Not even once. Oh, that's good. You know, the only thing I regret in, in relation to that is I wish I didn't go to law school. I mean, I loved uni. It was an amazing time. Where I went to uni was paradise. I met amazing people. But I wish mm-hmm. I'd done something different because it set me on that path. That's the only regret I have. But I, I don't for one second regret it. I, I, you know, I talk to my old classmates and the vast majority of them don't work in, in the legal sector anymore for the exact same reasons as mine. Because it's soul crushing. It's destroying. It consumes all the joy. And you have to be a certain type of person uh-huh. to succeed in, in, that, in that kind of work. And I don't think I'm that. I don't think I could be as competitive or cutthroat or... That that, that 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 kind of work requires you to be. But did it teach you anything that's useful in your current profession? Um, hmm. To be fair, a lot of the skills in law are transferable to DJing, I think. I think how you deal with people and being able to juggle many, many, many things at the same time. With DJing, that's what it's like. You know, you, you don't get a break. I mean, um, I mean, me personally, I, 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 I kind of feel like Sometimes DJing is like running a marathon sometimes for me. Depends on who, depends on which DJ you ask, but I tend to focus 100% all the time. You know, I, I think about what I'm going to do next, oh, really? what I'm going to play next. Yeah, all the time, yeah. Like, if you try and talk to me when I'm playing, you will just get a brick wall. You won't get much sense out of me because I'm just focused on the set. And a lot of people interpret that as kind of rudeness on me being ignorant, but it's not, it's just, it's just the way that I, that I play. So I'm not saying any of this to offend you. I'm saying this to understand. So you put a record on and then you're not like, oh, I'll just chill out for three minutes and then put the next one on. You're thinking like, what, what's in the same key as this? What's the same BPM? Like what? Yeah. And sometimes I'm thinking two or three songs down the line. You know, I'm Ah, thinking about where I need to be. There's a, I mean, a lot of DJs probably do plan this set beforehand, but I don't. I, Mm -hmm. I decide what to play pretty much on the night. I, I just like it that way. I think it becomes a lot more interesting. I think it makes it a lot more dynamic and a lot more fun. Um, and so in this planning three or four songs ahead, do you ever then have to shift the boat? Because I don't know why I said shift the boat. You'd like to change course because the crowd isn't responding to the music that you're currently playing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the time. I mean, that's I mean, that's uh-huh. one of the first things you have to learn to when you're DJing after you've actually learned to mix is you have to be able to learn to read a crowd. But I think I'm lucky right now in, in that I play a lot of venues where they have a certain style and, and people come in and expect a certain thing. So it's, mm-hmm. it's very hard, I think, to lose a crowd now in these kind of venues. I think if you're playing like you know, a slag and lettuce where you've got to play like all the genres, you know, you'll go from something really cheesy to, you know, something yeah, really yeah. R&B, um, you know, which is my idea of hell. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I've been lucky, especially, especially like Kiki's the best example of this in the world, you know, like Kiki's crowd was so up for it. You could play almost anything and they would dance to it. That's, that is one of my favorite things about Kiki was the people because, they, you know, you go into a lot of clubs and the DJ only has to play one bad song and you lose the crowd. And I've played plenty mm-hmm. of those kind of gigs and it's really annoying because years ago it used to be crowds would trust the DJ. They would stay on the floor and they'd be like, okay, where's he going with this? Mm-hmm. And now it's not. It's like, we've got to hear hits all the time. Every second it has to be amazing. Oh, that's really interesting. So you've noticed this change in the way oh, that yeah. crowds uh, interact. Yeah, like like uh, now, I mean, you, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm talking in very kind of generalistic terms, but um, I think now in a lot of clubs, they want the DJs to create moments every moment. Mm-hmm. And that's not what uh, the kind of DJing I was brought up with. I was I was taught out that the moment is set. It's a journey. It's a, I mean, as corny as that sounds, it is a journey. It's a musical experience. You know, you're not mm-hmm. trying constantly, you know, and, and that's why the, the length of songs has gone down. That's something a lot of people have noticed, even when they're not DJs. You know, years ago, you'd have long dance songs. Now they're about three minutes long. It's not even enough time to pee. So now you have to make a pee mix. Oh. So, yeah. you know, like back in the day, you're like back, back, back in the day, um, you know, when I was younger, um, you could just stick a, <laughs> a really long age. song on. But now you have to have an actual mix. Oh, yeah. And because you can't just go to the urinal and pee. Like, exactly. You have to queue up for the cubicles. See? Like, that could be, like, 15 minutes. Oh, okay. I ain't that bad. I don't have, like, a prostate problem that I know of. But... No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no. The comment I'm making is on the propensity for gay men to wait to use the cubicle or to do drugs or have sex in there. 
Yeah, all those Which things then holds all it up all for great. everyone else. Yeah, and I think this is the reason that I can use the urinal because I did used to be pee shy, but then I'm also really impatient and I hate queuing. So, getting over the pee shyness one. So, do you like kind of just kind of stand there, you know, like dick in hand, and kind of just like willing the pee to come out, like demanding it comes out? No, well, so it used to be. Like, I used to do that thing where you'd go up to the urinal and get your dick out and then, like, nothing would happen. And you'd be like, I know I need to pee. I know you're in there. Come out. And then it just didn't. And I really don't know what changed in me, but now I can just be like, yep, here we go, and piss. Damn, I wish I could do that. Maybe this is how I make my million. Yes. It's training. Pee coaching. Yeah, become some kind of pee shyness coach. Would that help if I stood behind you shouting? No. Absolutely not. I'd, I'd, I'd probably shout back, but I'd be like, no, no. And the, and, and the problem is... What if is, I sang to your penis? Like, you know, come out, come out wherever you are. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of flat that you think my penis is big enough to be a microphone, but... Um, no, know, I'm singing thanks. to it. I'm like, you know, coaching the pee out. I might need to workshop this idea, but I think you there's probably something will. in it. I mean, it sounds like Germany would love it. I mean, if, 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 if anything <laughs> I've heard about Germany is true, but they I would think love also, that. But I think also, you know, if I know anything about toxic masculinity, if there is a straight man who cannot pee at the urinal, I'm going to be able to make tons of him. <laughs> I don't think he's going to like you singing to his dick, though. Yeah, I might need to change my message. You might have to say, like, you know, you know what, what was it? Um, no homo. You know, no, I, <laughs> I could do that. Yeah. I mean, a buck's a buck, right? Well, <laughs> um, but yeah, Kiki. So yeah, let's go back to Kiki. Like yes. I might have said that a few times already this evening. What, um, like, how did you find out that it was closing? So I remember finding out when I got kind of tipped off by, by someone that it had it, been bought you know, and that it was going to be rebranding into this this new bar. And and my first instinct was obviously sadness. You know, it was kind of like, you know, that place meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to anyone who's played there. You know, you ask a lot of Manchester DJs about what their favorite time playing was. Um, and they'd probably say Kiki because it was just mm-hmm. so chaotic and so much fun. And, you know, it was, it was, it was an awesome place to play. Um, without it being too big, you know, like a lot of DJs are size queens when it comes to the clubs, but Kiki was never about being massive. It was always big enough to be good without mm-hmm. it being like a cavernous warehouse. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was great. It, it was a lovely space to play. Um, but then I remember, you know, it, it got bought by a, by a huge group and, and they were going to turn it into a, you know, a really upscale kind of cocktail bar. It's, it's like, like I said earlier, it's just the way it is in Canal Street, you know, venues evolve, venues change. What the customer wants changes. So, you know, the venues have to adapt or die. So at the time of finding out, did it seem like a big deal? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was sworn to secrecy, you know, because it, it wasn't public knowledge. But I remember just being like, you know, it's, it's a huge deal. You know, Canal Street's losing what I considered to be the best venue on the street in the, in the entire gay village. You know, it's one of the best. And, you know, it made me wonder, you know, what, what's, what's, what's it going to be like? But then... Canal Street adapts, you know, other venues start doing things differently. And and that's just the way it is. And, and I mean, that's why the gay village in Manchester is amazing, because it doesn't matter what you're looking for in a night out. It's got everything for everyone. You want to go to a big banging club, they've got that. You want to go and hear Kylie and Madonna classics on loop, they've got that. Hell, they've even got a, a bar dedicated to music from musical theatre, you know, oh, Oscars, wonderful. which is amazing. And they do really nice gin there as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and that's what I always say to people, you know, when I talk to people and they say, you know, where would you recommend? I say Manchester, because even if you've got quite a diverse group that have different things they want from a night out, the gay village really does cater well for that. It has just so many different bars, so many different experiences, and it's not the kind of place you can just go for one weekend and say, I've done it. No, you, you've got to go again and again and again because it's it's different all the time are you paid by the manchester tourism board by any chance i should be shouldn't i i should be like a gay village ambassador (laughs) 
Do you have any memories of Kiki or clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space to tell me all about what you got up to. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Lost Spaces Pod. And whilst you're at it, go and give Craig some loving. You can find him on Twitter as DJ Craig Law, or you can listen to his mixes on mixcloud.com slash DJ Craig Law. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I have been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, Well Groomed Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now on all streaming platforms. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Gay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces.